Continuing our discussion of Trojans, let's talk about some of the uses of Trojans and the process for getting one built and put on a machine. Now, as you know, Trojans typically listen on TCP or UDP ports, so they do listen on the network. So one thing you might check when you're looking at your system is to see what particular ports your system is listening on and trace those back to processes and see if there's any that you can't identify. Although sometimes it's difficult to trace a Trojan just by TCP and UDP port alone because it may use a popular port that your system should be using. Now Trojans aren't always active. They may be silent until activated. Now typically there is some malware running there, but they may not do their destructive business until the right time. And this may uh, require a command from the attacker. Now a Trojan may have a very specific purpose, like a botnet, or be a very general purpose Trojan, just uh, designed to mess with your system, to destroy data, log keystrokes, and so forth. Sometimes Trojans are used as backdoors into a system after an attacker has successfully hacked it. So they've hacked the system, they've gone into it, they've got privileges, they've elevated them, they've stole data. They may leave a Trojan also just in case everything else is discovered and their primary way of getting into the system is cut off. They may leave another Trojan resident in the system somewhere that they can use to get back in. Now, also Trojans are, are used very often to install other kinds of malware like rootkits, viruses, botnets, and so forth. Once again, a Trojan is an entryway into your system. It's the way of getting the foothold into the system. So it's not unusual to see a Trojan used to put other pieces of malware on the system like rootkits, for example. Now, let's talk about the process of creating a Trojan. A Trojan by itself is a piece of malware, and by itself, it probably wouldn't be able to function or do anything on your system unless acted on, unless the user double clicks it or it's executed somehow. So what happens is Trojans are embedded into actual executables, innocent looking applications, useful applications, games, whatever. There was a popular game a few years ago way back in the day called Whack-A-Mole. It was a cute little Windows game, but it also contained a known Trojan. And what happens is hackers will put these into these cute little programs using a wrapper program. And this wrapper program basically combines this malicious code with the program itself and then allows you to configure it. The Trojan program is configured however the attacker wants. The attacker configures the port it's going to listen on, the actions it's going to take, the IP address it needs to phone home to, and so forth. Then the big problem that has to be solved is the Trojan somehow has to get on the computer. We've talked about the different methods that that could happen. So the Trojan either is placed on the computer by the user, an unsuspecting user, or some other means. Maybe it's downloaded automatically from the web. Maybe it's on an infected USB stick. However it gets there, once it gets there, the Trojan application is loaded on the computer. Sometimes the user double clicks on it and runs it. And when that happens, something called a dropper uh, activates the Trojan and installs it. That's basically the installation program for the malware itself. Now, once it's installed, whatever malicious payload is contained in that Trojan, whatever set of actions it's supposed to do or malicious code it's supposed to write to the system, that code is executed and it's installed. Once that happens, the Trojan can do whatever it wants. It can call home, it can be remotely controlled, it can start keystroke logging and reporting those keystrokes back, whatever its intended purpose is. Now, there are some general types of Trojans that we see, and this list is by no means uh, conclusive. Uh, you could come up with any good reason to have a Trojan and create a Trojan just for that. General purpose Trojans, if you've ever heard of Back Orifice or Netbus, those are two popular general purpose Trojans that we saw a long time ago. They can do a little bit of everything. We saw network service Trojans like FTP Trojans and Telnet Trojans that are basically designed to open up an FTP port and send data through it. So you might see port 21 open up on a computer that shouldn't be. Remote desktop Trojans allow a hacker to take control of a particular system through remote desktop through VNC, for example, or RDP. You might see keyloggers that are Trojans, and obviously that's a very popular kind because it's used to intercept and get credentials and send them to an attacker. Email Trojans, obviously, can affect several things. They can cause random emails like spam to be sent, and that's what one purpose of a Trojan is, is to send uncontrolled email. Another purpose might be to propagate itself through email. 
Document Trojans are basically embedded programs in a document. The user would get it, open up the document, and when they do, the Trojan is executed. There are also web defacement Trojans whose sole purpose is to basically change HTML code and other active code on a website and possibly even deface the website itself, change the appearance, change the colors, font, and so forth. Botnet Trojans pretty much speaks for itself. A botnet basically is a network of bots that uh, are pieces of malware that control and attack other systems. Proxies. A proxy Trojan is used basically to get another machine, like your victim's machine, to wage the attack or to uh, download uh, attack tools or to store illegal content, for example. Now, some of the Trojan tools that are out there, and there are a ton of them, and we can't possibly cover every single one of them in this course, by the way, uh, but there's a, a lot of them out there. Some of these are older tools, but still very effective, especially if you can bit flip them a little bit or encrypt them such that antivirus will not pick them up. In fact, there's one tool, Netbus, and a lot of antiviruses don't even look for it anymore because it's that old. But it's been altered several times, and it's very easy to change, so it can fool an antivirus. But back orifice and Netbus are very popular Trojans. Netcad is a the Swiss Army knife of hacker tools. You've probably heard that before. Cryptomatic is a wrapper tool. HTTP RAT is another good Trojan. Uh, Flame is a framework itself that we've seen in the news over the past couple of years very recently. So there's all kinds of Trojan tools out there, and we're going to demonstrate a couple of these in the next session.